Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello, and welcome to Garden Success. We are always excited when you join us for the show. Normally, we're a call-in show, but uh, put the phone down. We're not going to be calling in today because we're coming to you by tape. Uh, But you will not miss out on anything today because we have a a very special guest, uh, Lisa Whittlesey, who is a senior program specialist with the Department of Horticulture, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here on campus at A&M. She's also a JMG program coordinator. We're going to talk about all that stuff, but first let me say, Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It is good to have you here. I've been looking forward to visiting with you about some of the things we're going to talk about today, and I know those of you listening, you will enjoy hearing some of the different things that you're going to find out about today. Uh, so Lisa, tell me a little bit about uh, your your uh, role in the JMG program. I know you launched that program a long time ago, but give the, the listeners just a, a overview, 30,000 foot overview of what is JMG? You know, it's really about about growing kids. We use horticulture and we use gardening as a as a platform, if you will, to grow kids, but kind of getting them excited and igniting that passion in them to learn, um, to give back to their community and to be successful, both in the garden, but hopefully in life. So that's kind of, that's sort of the 30,000 look at at what we do. Well, and and I think that's great that you put it that way, because a lot of times in horticulture, you know, my goal is not just to teach somebody how to grow a tomato. My goal is to change the way people eat, is to have a more valuable home property, is to have a healthier lifestyle. Uh, and horticulture is just a tool for that. So that's exactly. a, that's great. So you, you guys uh, are not only uh, teaching them, but you're really preparing kids for life. Well, we try, and and we do a lot of work, obviously, with schools, mm-hmm. with with after school programs and community based clubs, and you know, depend a lot on teachers and volunteer leaders and others that are just passionate about working with kids yeah. to help, you know, be docents and deliver the message, if you will. Right. Well, we we just did a uh, school gardening conference, several of us counties, and and uh, JMG folks, including Lisa, y'all were a huge part of making that a success. Uh, our keynote was Charlie Hall, and Charlie was talking about uh, the way that interacting with nature and plants causes uh, kids to do better on tests. Uh, if they're struggling with ADHD, it helps with that. Uh, just the whole nature thing. And a lot of times you think, well, they need to get in for the three R's. But your JMG program not only provides the nature connection, which is a mental well-being, uh, it also affects things like the three R's. And tell us a little bit about some of your curricula and how that happens. Exactly. Well, and, you know, we try real hard. Our team comes from, I'm the only horticulturist on our team. We have a lot of um, educators on our team mm-hmm. with, with school teaching experience experience as well and I did some of that too but some of what we really try to do is make sure that it's aligned to academic standards so math and social studies and um, language arts and things like that so we want to make sure that we're addressing those but the great thing about gardening is you're not just you know it's not like a class where you have okay here's math class and you go Mm -hmm. to science class and you go right right? it's such an integrated approach to teaching Mm -hmm. and for kids that that need to see it in a hands-on way Mm -hmm. and be able to see it in real life where it makes sense to Mm -hmm. them and it's not just a math problem on a sheet of paper right Um, i think it's really an effective way you know to approach that for yeah, sure. that's true and you guys do such a good job with the curriculum like you have one called literature in the garden that's all about the ability to write to read to understand to create be creative yeah and for those of you that you know you may have children you know younger children or grandchildren uh, there's some fabulous 
children's books that are themed around gardening and nature. Mm-hmm. And that can be a great springboard for gardening based lessons, which is what we do in the literature in the garden curricula. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, you read the story to the kids and then there's lessons that mm-hmm. they can do that relate to gardening that are very hands on. We also do a National Book Awards program that is called Growing Good Kids Book Awards. Uh, We have winners every year. We have a National Book Review Committee. Um, And if you look on our Junior Master Gardener website, we have a listing of all those and all the previous winners for the past, I think we've been doing it, 18 years. So Mm -hmm. those are listed on there with the synopsis of the book and the reading level. So if you're looking for some great Christmas ideas or birthday ideas, that's a good place to go for sure. Well, you have a number of of, uh, curricula other than literature in the garden that are part of the JM. MG umbrella. Tell us a little bit just about some of the different things that are offered. Sure. Well, we have kind of a core curricula that I would say covers a lot of aspects of gardening and soils Mm -hmm. and entomology and bugs and all that for elementary and for older students, middle school. But then we have some theme curricula like literature in the garden. Wildlife Gardener is really focusing on gardening for habitat. So Mm -hmm. if you're interested in pollinators and birds and all of those kinds of things, that's really a fun one for kids to do. And then of course, a lot of people now are interested in gardening and nutrition. And you know, like Charlie Hall, my friend Mm -hmm. and your friend says, Mm -hmm. if they grow it, they're a whole lot more likely to eat it. And so it's really about kind of um, having kids have that experience of growing it, tasting it fresh, Mm -hmm. learning how to prepare it in simple recipes so that hopefully we are making an impact on their nutrition and health. Yeah, I think so. And just that life uh, experience of growing and eating and appreciating food uh, it, it does so many things. I, I believe that it makes a difference in long-term health, and there are studies that kind of show that. Uh, we live in the time where fast food and Twinkies are the thing, and we know what that's doing to us as a nation uh, in terms of our, our health, our long-term diabetes and heart disease and all the issues that are biggies. Uh, changing it at the even elementary level, if not later, is such a big deal. And it really starts early on. Mm -hmm. Um, Our newest curricula we have is targeting early childhood. So it's really targeted for those preschoolers or kindergarten, so four and five-year-olds, because we know that some of those behavioral changes Mm -hmm. related to willingness to taste or try things start really Mm -hmm. early. And so trying to introduce them to those. The other thing is sometimes they may have to be introduced multiple times before they're willing to taste or try it. And I don't know about you. I mean, there may be some vegetables you're going, I like it fresh, but Mm -hmm. I don't like it cooked so much, right? Well, kids are the same way. And so having them be a part of that is is pretty important. That's great. That is great. Now, we've been talking about Junior Master Gardener uh, curriculum, but you also have a newer arrival that's not recent, but it's newer than JMG, and that's the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go, L-G-E-G. Exactly. That's really our our focus on integrating uh, gardening and nutrition and physical activity. And, and Skip, it really started as a we did a huge research project with University of Texas uh, School of Public Health and mm-hmm. the A&M School of Public Health looking at Uh, obesity prevention Mm -hmm. in children and impact on overweight and BMI. Mm -hmm. And so it was part of a five-year research study across the state where we followed kids for two years that were in the program to see what kind of changes it had on them as well as was their reach into the home. Okay. And you have a bunch of kids. I have kids at my house, and you remember those days in early school yeah. where they're coming home with a backpack, and it's got every kind of thing yes. in the world in it. And one of the things we found is the kids were doing this project at school, and we had about a third of the families that said they made the recipes at home that the kids did at school, oh, which wow. meant that... A, the kids had to get the recipe home in the backpack, had to encourage the parents for them to either grow the vegetables together or purchase them. 
and then wow. to be able to to taste them and try them. And these were really all in Title I schools, mm-hmm. so a lot of children that were living in limited mm-hmm. resource families. So that was pretty exciting stuff. And now yeah. we have about 120 counties in Texas through AgriLife Extension that are doing Learn, Grow, Eat, Go with schools in their communities. Wow, that's half the counties in Texas. Exactly. Right there. That's pretty amazing. And I know as I've gone to different counties in my career, uh, I, we've seen you guys present in a lot of counties. And I know in Houston, a huge, huge interest in the schools there uh, in healthier living and gardening and integrating the two. And But we see it everywhere. Uh, we exactly. Ha- in our and conference, we had a lot of interest around here in some of our schools. And, and it really is a, a team effort because if you want to have a program you know, if you're listening and going, gosh, I really want to have this program at my mm-hmm. child's school or my grandchild's yeah. school, you know, it takes a, it takes a village because yeah. the schools are taxed with so many things that they're required to do. Um, number one, it really helps because our curricula is aligned to those standards. Mm-hmm. But when we can come in with curricula that's aligned to standards and we can train teachers, but we can also bring in parent volunteers or community Mm -hmm. volunteers like master gardeners or there may be clubs or associations or garden clubs that do volunteer work when we can come collectively together to Mm -hmm. work together to implement programs and even involve folks like nutrition services or the pe groups um, Mm -hmm. in the schools that really builds sustainable programs that Mm -hmm. Um, because everybody's helping participate. That's true. Well, moving beyond the schools, uh, your curricula could be purchased by any parent or grandparent that exactly. wanted, wanted to utilize them with their kiddos or may- kids in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And also, you do other things beyond just the curricula. So like, for example, you're one of the contributing authors in Texas Gardener Magazine. So tell us a little bit about what you put in um, the magazine. Well, you know, Skip, I... I am about kids learning by doing. Mm -hmm. I just, I I think that's so important. And we saw that a lot during COVID where just the interest in gardening and being outside Mm -hmm. and kids are so tied to electronics that I think the opportunity to explore nature and to grow things is really, really um, exciting. So, you know, in Texas Gardener, I I try to, to... just provide families ideas of things that they can do with their kids Mm -hmm. just to you know what can you do to get your kids outside or get them involved in something that not only introduces them to nature but really builds quality time between you and the child and creates memories because i don't know about you i for me, I, a lot of my memories early on from gardening were with my father and with my mm-hmm. grandmother. And, mm-hmm. you know, we want our children to have those kind of memories, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. And I won't I won't uh, pile on with all the social media woes that we, ha- we have. Uh, but I think most parents would like to decrease screen time. And, and some of the isolation and bullying and all the things that, that can come along with that, uh, my happy place, and I know I'm biased, but my happy place is being outside. If I have a rough day at work, I, I can come home and just put my thumb on the end of a garden hose and just unwind out there just thinking. Uh, I like to sit in the garden and enjoy it, but I've learned that. But most people today don't. You know, you mentioned growing up with dad and grandparents and things that gardened. Uh, a lot of people today don't don't have that. You know, maybe there's some faint memory of grandma, but uh, a lot of young families, and and we get contacted at the extension office by people that want to get their kids involved. They want to try gardening. They didn't, maybe mom and dad didn't grow up gardening, but they want their kids to have that experience. And so having a package where they can get out and try it and not be afraid of failing. Well, and we try to, I call it remove fog, Mm -hmm. fear of gardening, (laughs) because, you know, a lot of the parents And even some of the grandparents of these children may feel like, uh, you know, I like the idea, but I don't know a lot about gardening. You know, guess what? You can get in there and learn it together. And sometimes, you know, the the failures, too, are things that can be life lessons and learning lessons, you know, for the kiddos. Because 
I mean, sometimes insects come and eat yeah. things, right? And sometimes we have drought and sometimes we have floods and that's yeah. just reality. And those are things that happen in life, right? And right. we have to be resilient and be able to deal with them. I'm trying to remember who said this. It doesn't really matter, but uh, you got to kill a lot of plants to be a good horticulturist. Uh, and so <laughs> feel free to kill kill plants because that's how we learn. And, and you that's why there's seeds. <laughs> and that's why there's garden centers. You can go get another one. Exactly. Well, and, and <laughs> really and truly um, have fun doing it. I, I think that's, you know, that's the biggest thing yeah. is feel free to experiment and mm -hmm. to explore. And, you know, I have to tell you a funny thing. We we have an activity with Junior Master Gardening called Bug Suckers. And yes. it's making homemade insect aspirators. So if, if you're trying to envision this, think a insect vacuum cleaner made with a a plastic pill, bottle, pill bottle and holes <laughs> and, and aquarium tubing but right. the kids love it but they'll take those outside and they'll be like i don't see any bugs mm -hmm. right because right. they're not looking for them and mm -hmm. so it's a great way well if you were a bug where would you be <laughs> right and have them think about looking under leaves looking yeah. un, you know at the soil surface and so really teaching them to be more observant and right. then it's amazing because then every time they go outside oh my gosh <laughs> i saw this insect or i found this happening and right. it just makes them i think a little more observant of their yeah. surroundings and it it does build another life skill and that that ability to think outside the box the ability to uh, be creative to to tap into the wonder around them. Uh, you mentioned people afraid of failing. I always say that nobody has a brown thumb. There are no brown thumbs. There are only uninformed thumbs. And AgriLife Extension exists to inform your thumb. So if you want to know how to, <laughs> if you want to know how to garden, right, if you want to know how to garden, call us. Go online to Aggie Horticulture. Look at the free publications that are there. Oh and, my goodness. And, and, Skip, you know this, during during COVID, we did so many videos, and we are still doing mm -hmm. live videos um, every week on Facebook Live on Wednesday and Fridays. You can find those, and we save all the recordings, um, but when you catch us live, we even have answer questions and try to be able to fill questions that, that gardeners may have, but mm -hmm. there's a bank of videos that are wonderful resources yes. on a variety of different topics, so right? Go to aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu Aggie and look on the page for the for the Facebook Live. Mm -hmm, yeah, exactly. that's lots of good stuff on there. And by the way, uh, JMG has a website. And we tell do. us a little bit about that and what people can find on there. So our website is jmgkids.us. And the reason it's .us is our program is international. So we have programs in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. But the home for JMG is here mm -hmm. at Texas A&M, but we have collaborative partnerships with the other land-grant universities. We also have a lot of international programs. So mm -hmm. we do projects with the Peace Corps. We do projects some with the Borlaug Institute for mm -hmm. International Agriculture mm -hmm. and, and various groups that have an interest um, in working with children and gardening. So Yeah, and I think you were mentioning earlier that uh, – I think, is it Kazakhstan that uh, you guys have a project going on? Yeah, we just um, are going to be starting a project with the Borlaug Institute in Kazakhstan, working oh. with um, some school nutrition programs and gardens. So we're pretty excited about about that. Cool. Um, so just, just really helping communities, whether they're here in the county or it's right. in Texas or with other states um, or internationally to right. kind of get started and so on our website you'll find our contact information you can sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter we mm -hmm. send that out every other week um, so there's a link at the bottom of our website about that there's resources where you can look at all the different curricula we have with sample activities um, there's information for teachers and for parents on okay. how to support the program and we have a lot on there about Learn, Grow, Eat, Go and our early childhood Learn, Grow, Eat, Go because there's so much interest lately with particularly with nutrition and yeah. gardening. And so a whole lot of resources related to that. And, of course, I mentioned the literature books mm -hmm. um, that are there. So lots of things that are there. And we are very active on social media. So be mm -hmm. sure and follow at JMG Kids. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we have a YouTube channel. So, yeah, yeah we try to do all those things. Well, uh, 
I've known Lisa for at least 30 years. I'm sure it's longer than that, but we don't care to exactly find that <laughs> number. Uh, but uh, from back in the time when you worked here in uh, Bryan uh, with the prison, women's prison program in there in gardening and then moved on into what you found now. But I'm, I'm telling you guys that are listening to this, I, this is a... This program is like one of the shining stars, of, in my opinion, of the of the A&M system and the Hort Department. Uh, we do a lot of programs that reach people locally, and that is critical and important. It's it's the foundation of what we do. But the JMG and LGEG, we're talking about programs that are reaching not only across the state and the country and other countries, as Lisa said, but are winning a lot of awards. And I, I'll brag on you. Uh, so you just have to give me some examples of some of the the uh, accolades that this program has achieved? Well, we've, you know, we're fortunate. We've been recognized, um, you know, by um, the Priester, which is a national um, health awards program. Okay. We've been recognized by, you know, National 4-H with yeah. some of the work that we've done and, and have been involved, um, have won Vice Chancellor's Awards, mm-hmm. Team Awards for some of our projects. But, you know, the the reason it's successful and and I'm I'm just this is just the truth is we have really wonderful teams of people that are passionate about it because mm-hmm. our office here isn't really huge, mm-hmm. you know. We have three full time people and two student workers. Wow. But we have wonderful county extension employees mm-hmm. across the state. We have very active master gardener programs that many do volunteer work to support junior master gardeners. And so, you know, that's that's really why it's successful is there's so many people. And, and we see our role is to really equip others to be successful, to, yeah. to be able to take it and lead it. So yeah. we do a lot of train the trainer and you know, you mentioned my time teaching at the prison. Um, I saw when I taught there the impact gardening had on my students. And because it's a minimum security facility, some of them had children that were able to come periodically mm-hmm. to visit them. And they wanted to garden with their kids. And that was a program through extension for us mm-hmm. to be teaching out there. And we didn't have anything really to support children's yeah. gardening. And so it was really out of that need mm-hmm. that, you know, it just got placed on my heart that we need to do right. a junior master gardener program. And thank goodness there were some people like Doug Welsh and some folks that are good at fundraising that helped us to yeah. get started. But you know, it's it was because of the impact that we saw on people mm-hmm. um, that that we really felt like it was it was something that was worthy. Well, one of the things th- th- there are a lot of people across the country interested in teaching kids about gardening. There's there's nonprofits and and many things. That's a wonderful thing going on. One of the things I think that has made your programs stand out is the quality of what you produce, the graphics, the visual appeal, and then of course the content. We're talking about like everything with AgriLife Extension is it's all research-based. We don't sell stuff, uh, you know, uh, products. And it, for us, it's about what does the research say? And y'all put that in there. But when you look at one of your books, uh, I can see how a kid would grab it and want to flip pages because it's so interesting, so professionally done. And I just commend you and the whole team over the decades that, that y'all have been working on this to for th- that kind of work because it, it is outstanding. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, we're fortunate within AgriLife Extension to have a wonderful communications department mm-hmm. and editors and folks that help with that. But we really there's a few things that we dial on the sword for and that Mm -hmm. one is quality if we're going to put it out there and it's going to have our name on it it's going to be quality it's going to be evidence-based we pilot test all of our curricula our early childhood curricula that just it's been out almost a year Uh, we piloted in 85 different locations and in 15 other states so we we really are committed to making sure that what we put out there is evidence-based and it's relative and that it really works you Mm -hmm. know like because sometimes we'll have a lesson Mm -hmm. and it goes out there and the teacher's like you know it didn't really work this way but we tweaked it and we did this and that's so important to help us to shape curricula and lessons to make them even more meaningful for the end user that's great 
Well, I, I I enjoy talking about JMG and LGEG and the and the work that you guys have done. And I wanted listeners just to be aware of that we got something going on here that is reaching literally reaching the world now. Uh, but I want to shift gears a little bit, and we've got uh, folks listening, and maybe. Maybe if they say, okay, I'm sold. We're going we're gonna to do stuff with the kids. I see all the wonderful stuff. I'm going to go check it out. But I want to give them some things to do in the months to come. We're about to enter the holiday season. There's Halloween and, and uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all the, uh, all the holidays. Um, and you are a magician when it comes to arranging things from the garden. If none of you, if you've ever watched any of the videos, and there's some online, you can go check out on Aggie Horticulture YouTube page. Uh, but let's talk to people in terms of what can they do in using things from their yard to make that special meal, that special family gathering, that whatever, uh, beautiful. And, and plus, it's fun. You know, I'm not a super totally. designer, but when I design something, uh, you know, nobody thinks their baby's ugly, right? And so <laughs> my babies <laughs> are cool. Now, if a florist walked in, they'd probably, you know, make a U-turn and hit out the door. But tell us about that. Well, you know, I just think it's it's stimulating to, to be creative. And yeah. a lot of people, I think, sometimes kind of, oh, I'm just not I'm just not creative. And I just that is just malarkey. Right. <laughs> um, little kids don't have those parameters. And I think they sometimes know. the older we get, we're like we feel like we have to stay within this mm-hmm. line. And so I just want I like to encourage people that. You know, when you do floral arrangements Mm -hmm. and stuff, you put part of yourself in the design. I could give Mm -hmm. everybody the same flowers and they would all look a little bit different when I'm teaching. And I I think that's part of the joy. And I told you before that, you know, my garden, it's more cottage Mm gardeny look at my house. And if if I grow things, I want things that are functional in the landscape. But I got to have stuff I can cut Mm -hmm. because... I am constantly going out in my yard and cutting things Mm -hmm. and bringing it inside. And Mm -hmm. whether it's in little small containers or if I'm doing designs, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just fun to be able, you know, to do that and use some of the things that you can grow yourself. Well, there, there was a time when I thought in order to have an arrangement, I had to go to a floor shop. And that's a great way to get beautiful things. But when I started to discover the ability to use natural materials from the roadside or, or a farm or ranch uh, and actually in your landscape and make something out of them. Now I look at stuff differently. I'll be driving down the road and I think last fall I looked and the farkleberries on William right. Fitch were a beautiful maroon. We like maroon around here. <laughs> and I just was clipping some branches to bring home and put in an arrangement with that beautiful maroon farkleberry, which you don't go to a florist shop and say, I want something made with farkleberries, right? Correct. So well, ev- everybody's wondering now, what the heck is a farkleberry? <laughs> Let me it. Google that Google real quick. <laughs> well, and you know, I think about this time of year, um, we have a lot of native beauty berry mm-hmm. that you might see and those yeah. beautiful, like bright purple berries. Mm-hmm. Um, those are wonderful in fall arrangements. I love to use that. Yopon, as y'all know, is prevalent Yopon. everywhere, yeah. but it's a great thing to include if you're mm-hmm. doing, um, you know, kind of a bountiful cornucopia type arrangement, yes. or if you're doing holiday mm-hmm. sprigs or things for your table, those are things that are readily available that you can use. I also love to use ornamental grasses. A lot of people have those in their yes. landscape. So, you know, this time of year, using some of those seed heads and having that, it's just a great transitional thing mm-hmm. to include in your home as they transition into fall. Um, and I think a lot of people have been so relieved that we've gotten a reprieve in the heat. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot of trees that got some heat damage from yes. the extreme temperature. So I needed kind of some transitional stuff for my mantle. I went outside and I had some dead branches on several M trees. I cut them. The The leaves were still hanging on. Yeah. And I put them in containers on my mantle, and it looks fantastic. So yeah. don't be afraid to go out and include some of those things. So, yes, dead branches can be created. Well, yeah. I mean, you can go into a, a, some nice home store, and you see a vase with just sticks coming out of it. And people look at that and go, oh, it's in a home store. It's beautiful. I want that. Well, you can make that. You exactly. Know? And I was talking about driving the, the roadsides. We have the, the winged elms here, the 
or I'll uh, just say there is a species called winged elm, but there are other elms that have structures on the branch, and, and it makes a so really interesting. interesting branch to, to yeah. use those. Uh, so I like the fact that you mentioned some of the ornamental grasses. There are the there are wild grasses that look pretty cool, too. Uh, like even Johnson grass. Okay. Johnson. Okay. Now, now you've, <laughs> now, uh, I'm a redneck, but I don't know. Okay. Go ahead. You know, my, my dad <laughs> would just, he would go, oh my word, Lisa, I know. really? Uh, You're going to throw some nuts edge in there uh, next, Lisa? <laughs> right. But, you know, they really can be quite, yeah. they really can be quite beautiful. And of course, yeah. this time of year, the goldenrod, you'll see yes. some of that. Oh, that's another gosh. one that's, um, that's real prevalent, that's just native, that's yeah. growing, that you might include, right. you know, to it's, be able to use. That is great. That the uh, fall bloomer. Wow. What a what a wonderful opportunity. Uh, so what, let's talk about the landscape, though. You know, we have a lot of things in the landscape. And occasionally I'll go to a florist shop and I'll go, oh, they used wax leaf ligustrum as some greenery in there. Exactly. Or they used a, uh, if you have cast iron plant, uh, aspidistra, uh, big, bold leaves, you'll find those in, in arrangements as well. So let's talk a little about landscape materials. You know, I, I'll talk a little bit about greenery first. Okay. Um, you mentioned aspidistra. That's a great one. Here's something cool on that. You can take a floral wire and mm -hmm. put on the back mm -hmm. and use um, a floral tape over it. Okay. And so it allows you to bend the leaf. So if you want to have really a <laughs> cool you're shape okay. in your arrangement. Um, but I do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But things like um, Eliagnus is mm -hmm. one that I use a okay. lot. Ligustrum, mm -hmm. Pittosporum is another one. Mm -hmm. um, Asparagus fern. I have huge yes. containers of asparagus fern. I use it a lot. Um, There's several other ferns that mm -hmm. that I grow that you know I just I like to use the foliage from it. It's easy to use and mm -hmm. herbs. I use herbs a lot as greenery in design. So things like rosemary, basil are two that that I use a lot. Those and are great. you know we even like. Um, basil when they have the blooms on it it's yes. real interesting there's yes. so many different kinds now that mm -hmm. have different colors of foliage and almost deep purple to some of yes. the blooms and and it's quite lovely that, in that is nice there and they even are breeding varieties for ornamental uh there's one i want to say cardinal maybe the name i'm not sure but it it just has these big red uh bloom clusters in the, the on the top of the right. or the ends of the branches and you don't have to think about i think sometimes people think oh i have to have a herb bed mm -hmm. right or an herb garden mm -hmm. i have herbs intermixed yeah. with a, a lot of my flowers just because you know they're quite lovely i have creeping mm -hmm. thyme i have oregano mm -hmm. um kind of on the edge of some of my beds as borders i love sage i love to cook and so sage is so beautiful and the foliage is yes. lovely and mine has been coming back year after year mm -hmm. you know I, cool. I you know i put some drop claws and things down when we had really yeah. cold weather but you know i was able to you know to have them year right. after year that those are those are really good examples, and there there's a, a rosemary, uh, one called Gariza, and uh, I think barbecue maybe another name, but it's long straight stems, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more so than most rosemaries. And number one, it's it's a rosemary, so you can use it for cooking, but uh, and and barbecue skewers in the case of that name, but you can also it makes a, a nice arrangement. And exactly. Then the and trailing types bloom better, and so that would be something coming down is more of a lateral. And uh, sometimes, feature. you know, I think in floral design, I took a lot of floral classes. I had my own business for a while, so I love that's kind of a passion and fun mm -hmm. thing for me. But we have to think about textures, right? And so when you're mm -hmm. thinking about using greenery, you know, there's some that are really uh, coarse textured, mm -hmm. so things like the aspidistra and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and then things that are more fine textured. I've done arrangements where I've used all greenery and okay. having a mixture of the coarse textured and fine texture uh -huh. adds a lot of interest. Um, I even went out and got sunflower, wild sunflowers after the petals had dropped and just used the middles, those mm -hmm. heads, and they're so interesting, and it adds a lot of, of texture into the design, mm -hmm. and it's great. Um, even crepe myrtle, like how the branches kind of 
bend are yeah. lovely. And then this time of year in the fall, go and get some of those seed heads. Those are great to put in your fall arrangements and maybe to mix in with acorns and other things that, yeah. that kind of have that fall feel. That that is that is good. Now I think have you done something uh, from garden to vase? Uh, you were talking about that a little bit earlier, I believe. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I you know I get asked to do that program a lot because a lot of people are, are passionate mm-hmm. and interested in that. And so, in fact, I'm doing a program in San Angelo this weekend mm-hmm. um, for one of their area conferences on landscaping, and it's that's the whole theme is from the garden to the vase. And so, you know, I'm covering things like. Um, you know, some design principles and, okay. you know, colors and textures and form. But but also, what are some flowers that you can grow um, that, mm-hmm. that cut well? Uh, one of my most favorite is zinnias. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great. I love the old-fashioned ones that mm-hmm. have all the different colors. They're beautiful. They're fun for kids to grow. The more you cut them, the more they bloom. Um, some of the flocks are also beautiful. The the John Fannick mm-hmm. flocks is one I love. It's very fragrant. I love to use it. Of course, a lot of the garden roses. I mean, we have some garden roses that are fantastic. Or even if you have drift roses or mm-hmm. things like that, they look beautiful mm-hmm. tucked into uh, design. So I love things that I can grow like Good. that and be able to use. And sometimes you have to just try it out. You know, sometimes you cut them. And I like to test them first to see, okay, is it going to hold up, right? Because some things things you cut it and it kind of may immediately start to wilt. So it's good to test and try those things. Um, I love to grow poppies. I love the color Mm -hmm. of them. I have some of the double burgundy ones that Mm -hmm. are beautiful. Greg Grant had given us some seeds for those. Um, But I love the seed heads. So they are excellent in design. So after... You can save some of them to mm-hmm. save your seeds for next year, but include some of those in, in designs, and it just adds so much interest, you yeah. know, in arrangements. So that that is interesting. And I, you were talking about your garden style. You want a garden that is functional in terms of your uh, arranging habits and stuff. So uh, I think planning ahead for that kind of thing, looking at some of the plants that you like that you think might be good for that, and uh, Considering when you plant too, like right now is the time when the best time really to plant uh, larkspurs uh, mm-hmm. for next spring's bloom. Uh, the uh, well, snapdragons is another one I love to grow. Yes, and a lot of those of you can plant them in the fall. Yes, and you want to choose the types that get really tall, mm-hmm. rocket, so that you the have rocket tops, so you have a nice long uh, stem, and that brings us back to kids. But showing a kids why it's called a snapdragon is kind of fun. Exactly, <laughs> and in larkspur. The bunny larkspur yes. that if you look yeah. at the individual bloom, it looks like a bunny. And, yes. of course, the colors, the purple and lavender and pink and white. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're blooming about the time of Easter. So it's yes. a great thing to be able to have in your garden right. for sure. So now is also uh, poppy time. There's lots of different kinds of poppies out there. Uh, the, the poppies, the old bread seed poppy, uh, the blooms themselves don't last a long time. They kind of shatter and fall right. apart pretty quick for a cut. But but those the, pods the are pods amazing. The pods are great. And really, I use more of that in the design. So mm-hmm. I enjoy the flowers while they're mm-hmm. in the bed. Yeah. And then I go, yeah, <laughs> and then then I go the and cut. cut them. And, you know, let me tell you, if you've never seen how mm-hmm. poppy heads distribute the seeds it's mm-hmm. fascinating because that yeah. little capsule comes up a little pepper shaker it's like a pepper shaker exactly <laughs> you know that that is so fun i showed that to some kids and yeah. they just thought that was the coolest thing that so. is a cool thing the um uh, other things to plant now uh sweet peas oh uh, if yes you look, and on all these things shop and get the varieties that are going to be good cuts if that's what you want like we mentioned the tall uh, snapdragons. There are sweet peas that uh, stay kind of compact. There's some that are more fragrant than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you plant these in the fall, think of them like our blue bonnet, the our state flower, which by the way can be another nice right flower. flower. If you get the right, there's a there's a West Texas blue bonnet that has especially long stems, but uh, it also makes a decent cut flower. Uh, so they're they're planted now, or the seeds come up now. And they form a little rosette. They go through the winter. And then when the it warms up and the day length changes, they take off and bloom. That's true for a lot of these plants that we're talking about. Uh, and 
you can plant larkspur in the spring, but you, you'll do better if you plant them now. Well, and, you know, they just have time. Even things like petunias, I love mm-hmm. planting those in the fall because it really allows those roots to get mm-hmm. established. And, you know, when I start getting cold weather at home, I use leaves to heavily mulch in mm-hmm. my beds and protect them, you know, if I'm worried about stuff freezing back. And it may freeze back a little bit, yeah. but, you know, I'll come back. Kind of like um, the Mystic Blue Spires is one of my favorite um, salvias yes. to use for cutting, you know, and it's one that dies back, but it comes back every year mm-hmm. and the bees love it. And it's a wonderful flower yeah. to have in arrangements as well. And we just have a lot of flowers like that. That, that are just so good. So they can be special things that aren't from here. They can be native things that are out in the woods and the roadsides. And uh, I I think now people are kind of going, okay, that's wonderful. I've seen beautiful arrangements. I believe Lisa's good at that. What about me? I, I don't have skills. So could you give some tips for arranging? Sure. So that they don't create something and go, yeah, I just can't do this. Probably one of the... Well, number one is I like to have variety in color and in texture. So mm-hmm. I always tell people that you want to have spikes mm-hmm. and you want to have rays or more rounded textures mm-hmm. and you want to have fillers, right? So your spiky things like larkspur or mm-hmm. snapdragons or the Salvia salvias, that's going to help make the form of your design. And so it kind of depends on the vase or container you Mm -hmm. use. Typically one and a half to two times the height of the Mm -hmm. container is a good rule of thumb on height. So if you've got a low container, your arrangements are going to be low and maybe elongated, Mm -hmm. just like the container. If you have a tall vase, you're going to need to have tall things in it for it to look, you know, balanced. So having that, having some rounded things like Uh, ray type flowers, Mm -hmm. whether it's sunflowers or zinnias, uh, maybe some more rounded form flowers Mm -hmm. like uh, roses or even carnations Mm -hmm. would be good. An arrangement can be nothing but that. That's I mean, you correct. can take you can take one kind of rose. We have one called Kowa Pink that uh, makes clusters of little small roses. Absolutely, you could put those in uh, Marie Daly, Marie Pavier, or is a very dainty little rose. You're not going to make a six foot arrangement out of it, but a little small thing that maybe you would put in the bathroom on a counter oh, when you have guests. Spending if you have the night. those drift roses, a lot of people have those in their bed, and they're in little small clusters. Those are wonderful, um, you know, to be able to use and. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, of things like that that you can combine. And, you know, a lot of people are like, well, do you use foam, mm-hmm. wet oasis foam, or do you mm-hmm. use water? Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of depends on the container you're using. I think a lot of people with water um, get frustrated because the flowers don't stay where mm-hmm. they want them to. So, yeah. I I recommend starting with your foliage first on those kind of designs because it will add a little mass. Mm -hmm. So then when you start adding your flowers, they stay secure. Or sometimes you can actually make a grid on the top with like um, an adhesive floral tape or Mm -hmm. even cutting duct tape into strips, right, to make a grid or a small piece of... um, It helps hold that floral foam in place, too. Exactly. Well, or even in a water container, you just have Mm -hmm. that on the top top Mm -hmm. right so that the stems stay within that grid so that that's kind of a a nice tip that i think um if you're Mm -hmm. cutting from your garden it's good to cut in the morning um i like to put them in warm water because they start to uptake and if you can get the little packets of floral preservative that Mm -hmm. helps it cuts down some of the bacteria in your water and then also provides sugar and nutrients Mm -hmm. and cutting on an angle is good because then when you insert the stem it's a little more surface area so they can take up water you know a little bit better so those are some things i think that are good Mm -hmm. you know good tips as you get started yeah maybe kind of looking around you can look online and see all kinds of arrangements and get ideas like maybe you like the form of that the shape of Mm -hmm. it the proportions of it or or something along those lines. There's um, a design I do a lot with people getting started called a vegetative design. And, and I like it because you arrange it like how 
the flowers would be growing in your garden. So, okay. for instance, you might have a low container and you put oasis that maybe comes up above maybe an inch of the top of the container. Mm -hmm. And then I like to use maybe a sheet moss to cover it okay. so you can't see the oasis. And let's say you have larkspur. Well, you might have five or six stems that are growing together just in one section, a clump, mm -hmm. like they would in the garden. Okay. Well, then what would you put next to it? Well, not something the same texture. So mm -hmm. maybe you had, you know, three zinnias from your garden that mm -hmm. looked like a daisy shape, and you could have them in that section. And then you may go to another section of your container, and mm -hmm. you might have... Um, a different flower or maybe some um, an herb kind of spilling out over the edge. I've even put small mushrooms on toothpicks and <laughs> tucked in there or spears of asparagus. But what you want it to look like is if you went and scooped a piece of your garden, your mm -hmm. flower garden, and put it inside. And okay. I think for people, even if you go to buy flowers that you know, they're those bouquets and they have one or two stems of this and three or four yeah. stems of that. And you're like, I don't know what to do with that. Right. So a vegetative design is kind of a nice way to get started. Well, that's, that's cool. Um, some of our uh, garden plants that we grow for foliage or uh, some other part of the plant actually bloom and give us a nice arrangement. Uh, let's see, what is the... Oh, gosh, I just went blank on the herb we put in, like, charro beans. Uh, oh, cilantro. Cilantro, cilantro. Sure. Yeah, coriander. Uh, so after cilantro bolts, those little dainty flowers are really cool for uh, using and an arrangement. Dill, dill is the same dill way. Is, dill is, is beautiful. And, of course, around here, some of uh, you may have seen the wild Queen Anne's lace, mm -hmm. right? And that's a beautiful filler, you yeah. know. I tell people that fillers are like... You know, your 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 line and your form flowers mm -hmm. are like the structure. So mm -hmm. if you're making a cake, that's yeah. your that's your your cake layers, right. right? And then you have your icing, which mm -hmm. is those those filler flowers. You mm -hmm. know, a cake wouldn't be great if it was all icing. Mm -hmm. Although some people might <laughs> might disagree with that. But you know, you wanna have um to remember it's the finishing touch, right? Okay. Yeah, that, that is cool. So look for those. I even let a few of my carrots every year bolt. I don't pull them up. And when they bolt, the flower is really attractive to a lot of beneficial insects. The little parasitoid wasps and things like that love it. Surfeit flies. Even uh, even onion. Yeah. Oh, o onion gosh. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And florists often buy the... There are these big, huge allium heads yes. that are like purple or whatever. Right. But even the small white ones that you might have from your home garden... Mm -hmm. I mean, they're great. Those are all all cool ideas. So, what about the longer vase life? Now, you mentioned cutting on an angle, so they'll put up pull up some water better. You mentioned the florist material, which every time I buy flowers, I get more of those little packets than I really need for exactly. those flowers. So, I've got a drawer full of them. And uh, but there are some other ways to kind of extend the life a little bit. Well, I mean, all of you may remember yourself picking wildflowers and putting in a vase mm -hmm. or your kids or grandkids bringing mm -hmm. them to you. And after about a day, yeah, smells horrible. Well, <laughs> a lot of that is because of the foliage that's in the container. Yeah. So removing the foliage that's down in the water mm -hmm. will help a lot to mm -hmm. extend the life. If you've got um, flowers that are in water, you know, every couple of days, I'll just drain the water mm -hmm. and add fresh water. And I think that's a good, you know, a good thing okay. to be able to do. Um, and then there are some flowers that just naturally hold and last yes. longer. I mean, it's just... Yes. Uh, if you're going to buy flowers at the grocery store, Alstroemeria is one of my most favorite. It will it's last amazing. forever. It's the last thing to die in the vase. <laughs> exactly. It's unbelievable. It'll last forever. And in at, in the home garden, zinnias is one mm -hmm. that they will hold for a long, long yeah. time. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned something earlier, too, in that you said pick in the morning because that we, we call it field heat. You're not bringing something in that's hot and is respiring, transpiring, whatever. Uh, but also picking at a at the right stage. And sometimes I've bought flowers before and I could look at them and go, you know, that flower is about 
three days away from starting downhill fast. Right. And so when you choose them in your garden, you can choose them at the right time. Well, and you can tell often, like, if they're starting to get more mature, mm -hmm. um, you know, you may see the, the center of the flower where the stamens are. They may start to get dark. Mm -hmm. um, um, the flowers may be slightly paler in color, the petals and things mm -hmm. like that. And those are all often indicators that they're starting to go downhill. Yeah. So if you can get them when they're more newly opened, yes. they're going to hold, um, you know, a little, a little longer for you. That's cool. Well, those are, there's so many different ideas and things that uh, we can use. I, by the way, I just have to, because I have an okra problem, uh, and, and we talked about redneck flower arranging, uh, okra stalks, when they dry, make They're beautiful. They're fantastic. Especially the little thin ones that sort of curl and get longer. I've also, I have a friend who actually paints them into little Santa Clauses and make Christmas ornaments oh my goodness, out of ochre so pots. <laughs> That's taking it too far, right? I, well, you know what? <laughs> Be creative and use what you have. I, you yeah. know, if, um, you know, I, I like my husband's family's from east texas and so we get pine cones mm -hmm. and those are fun to be able to use during certain times of the year burr oak if you have burr oak oh my, oh my goodness those acorns are so beautiful yes. inside the little caps they're just they're huge. gorgeous right and golf balls right so if you had a um you know a low tray that's mm -hmm. on your table like a wooden tray or a charcuterie board or mm -hmm. something and just having some cut of those you know, that bur yeah. oak with the acorns on it, and you might tuck in some, you know, crepe myrtle seed pods and yeah. some things like that. Just setting, not even in water, just to add a little sense mm -hmm. of fall for the season is, is fun to be able to do. Yeah, that that is a good idea. Yeah, something we haven't talked about uh, in flowers is fragrance. Um, a lot of the plants that we have in our landscape, we have there for fragrance. And, and uh, you mentioned using herbs and rosemary. My first thought when you said that is I'm going to be reaching out there, petting that centerpiece because <laughs> I love the fragrance of rosemary, you know, when it comes off. I of have the... to tell you a funny thing I did. Um, and I've showed this design before is, you know, I had a spaghetti dinner. And I got a loaf of French bread and I cut out a piece out of the middle and I lined it with just a Ziploc baggie and I put my oasis in there and I added rosemary and basil. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went and got some carnations at the mm -hmm. store. I had like five red carnations. I added those in there. Mm -hmm. um, I put in a part of a red bandana and then I put dry spaghetti noodles coming out of it. It was fantastic. You know, That's it didn't cool. cost me much, but it gave the feel right yeah, for that yeah. Italian party. So, that's yeah, a, that's a good idea. Uh, that, that is a very good idea. One of my favorite shrubs, and I, I hate its growth habit because it gets big. But the fragrance, and that's almond verbena. Oh, my goodness, it's uh, it, fantastic. And it, it just smells like vanilla almond kind of flavor. And long, spiky, and it just produces a lot of flowers. And it, when you put that in your house, it's an amazing one. Another one, probably probably the best. Now, I know a lot of people like gardenias, but we need to move about a few hundred miles east right. to start growing gardenias. But um, uh, white butterfly ginger, the Hedicium white oh, butterfly. Oh, sure. That is the strongest. When I think our uh, third daughter was born, We, I brought a white butterfly into the hospital room. And nurses were coming in from the hall wanting to know what was that fragrance. Because it, it's a gardenia-like uh, perfume well, fragrance. And, you know, if, if you're into bulbs, um, there's, I'm trying to remember the name, it's one of the crinum okay. lilies that mm -hmm. is so fragrant. Um Oh, goodness, I can't think of the specific, it's a lady's name, isn't that awful? I can't think of it. Um but uh, it's so that's... fragrant. I order it from Southern Bulb Company, okay. um, and it's fantastic. But yeah. um, it's one that Bill Welch had told me about, and I love it. I have it in my garden, and it's just so fragrant. And yeah. it's a fun one to be able to to bring in. And I, I have three Alice planted at mm -hmm. home. And, of course, this time of year, they have the beautiful Gosh. yellow blooms on it. And that's an awesome little filler. You it know, is. we talked about other it things is. as fillers, but... You know, it, if you it, wanted to do a design in a pumpkin or something like that yes. and add yeah. that and mm -hmm. even some orange, um, 
marigolds mm-hmm. and stuff like that to give a little sense of fall and some of the little um, basil with the purple okay. spikes on it, you know, just a little fall, simple thing. Well, that that is a great idea. I, you know, there's just so many ideas. Uh, a program I used to do and haven't done it lately is arranging with living plants and where you take a large, let's say it's one, an oval galvanized planter kind of thing and you put plants that are actually alive in it, but then cover with moss so that it looks like they're growing together. Because right. a lot of times when you try to get plants to grow together, they don't end up looking good. But but you can take a plant and put it in there. Uh, maybe it's an ivy. you can replace it. <laughs> right. Well, I had one that was in a basket, and we just used the strands of the ivy to wind around the handle of the basket. And it looks great. And you, you put it together, and instantly you've got something for that party tonight at the house exactly and then you can take them out of there and and water them individually or you can pull one out and put another one in Uh, so our house plants some of the colorful house plants that we have could all be put together in just a a, a very short time to create an instantly beautiful foliage and then you mentioned flowers then stick a few flowers in there just for the night. And you could you could stick those in using water picks, mm-hmm. or if you had small little vases that yes. you could tuck in there. Explain what a water pick is, and I, I did want you to go back and talk about the the uh, foam that. Uh, uh, water picks are they're just small little capsules. Of, sometimes they have a tip on the end. You add water and you just put the stem in there, mm-hmm. and you can tuck those in there. So it's great to kind of tuck little in tiny places. vase on a stick. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then Oasis, you can get wet Oasis foam. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of your hobby stores, hobby stores and mm-hmm. stuff will have that. And you just fill your sink with water and put it in, and that foam will go all the way down, and mm-hmm. it's fully saturated with water mm-hmm. at that point. So. You know, it's great to be able to have that's kind of that and pruning shears and some floral wire and stuff like that are just good little things to have. And again, those are available locally. Exactly. Many place crafts might be sold. Yeah. A a lot of craft stores or your some of your big box stores also Mm -hmm. have those. And of course, a lot of it you can order online as well. Mm. Okay. Well, and and when you think about flowers and arranging, vase is, of course, the first thing people think about. But we've talked about so many other ideas. And I, uh, I'm i just amazed at how people get creative. Uh, I remember the first time uh, Jim Johnson, I watched Jim Johnson build a, a design. He had barbed wire, a boat, and a a cactus pad uh, mm-hmm. with some other stuff. And when he got through, it was like... It was like amazing. Well, it's, you know, it's just looking. It's like we talked about with kids, having them go out and look at things a little bit differently, right? Like, what could I do with it, you know? Well, I hope that this has inspired you. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. thank you for asking Uh, me. We've been visiting with Lisa Whittlesey, Senior Program Specialist and JMG Program Coordinator. I hope you've been inspired. And uh, this uh, fall, I expect to see lots of people driving down the roadsides and crawling through their yard, pulling stuff uh, to make arrangements because you can not only enjoy your garden, but take it to a whole nother step of enjoyment. Exactly. That's really cool. Well, that's great. Well, you've been listening to Garden Success. We are normally a call-in show, and we'll be back live again next week. But thank you so much for being with us. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.